I'm now heading back to the 1950s to discover another top secret program that took surveillance to a whole other level. Alice Springs in 1955 couldn't have been further from the world stage. But unbeknownst to its inhabitants, it was about to become involved in the biggest geopolitical crisis of the century. This little man-made hump in the landscape is very intriguing. In fact, it's more than intriguing. This was at one time of top secret international importance because it was here where they used to monitor who'd got nuclear weapons and whether or not they were testing them. The business end was, was down there, of course. Harold, you were in the US forces at the time, weren't you? I was. So what was it exactly they were doing down there? This vault holds a set of seismometers that is used to detect earthquakes and nuclear explosions. And it's a part of the United States Atomic Energy Detection System. With the nuclear arms race hotting up, US Army General Dwight Eisenhower urgently needed a monitoring system that could detect atomic explosions anywhere in the world. Around 20 detection stations were set up, including one right here in Alice Springs. And it really was secret, wasn't it? Yes. We'd meet people downtown and they'd say, what do you do out there? Oh, we're a weather research station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even today, a lot of people around here don't know what no. this place was. They don't. Can we have a look inside? We absolutely can. There's okay. a ladder on this side. <laughs> right, am I going down first? I guess you're going down first. Wait. It's very rusty and a little bit scary. These old bones of mine don't work like they did when they were 20. Uh, here we go. In here. This is what we've got. Hang it on, Harold. Oh, getting there. Yeah. What would have been in these great big container things? The seismometers themselves were in here. I believe this was the vertical motion detector. That one there. And one of these was north-south horizontal motion, the other one was east-west. What was it actually that they detected? They, they detect ground motion. The actual ground that you're standing on never stands still. You don't realize it, but it's always moving. But essentially, that must be the earthquakes or yes. nuclear explosions. Yep. Yes. yep, that was our job, to, to record everything and then determine if anything was the nuclear events that we were looking at. In the early 60s, the, the Russians in the US was testing like every other day, it seemed like. But as time went by and, and nuclear test ban treaties were signed and, and, and moratoriums self-imposed were there and all that, you get half a dozen a year, maybe, I would suspect, of Russia. The US had their own share also. In retrospect, was it worth it? All that work that you did, was it worthwhile? I think that we made it a safer place for, for mankind, and I think we're still doing that. The organization still runs, it's still doing its job, and they do it really well. You know what I find so extraordinary? 40 years or so ago, all that was cutting-edge technology, and now it's as redundant as a cannon from the Crimean War. It's such a fast pace our history goes now, doesn't it? It's doubtful that Harold's equipment would have detected it, but for my final time travel, I'm going from the 50s to the 70s, when a political earthquake took place that shook Australia to its very core. I've come to Canberra, the heart of Australian government, to expose a 40-year-old secret. The 1975 dismissal was a constitutional menage a trois, pitting PM and Labour hero Gough Whitlam against the ambitious but weak-willed Governor-General Sir John Kerr and the autocratic Liberal opposition leader Malcolm Fraser. These days, it's a well-told story but I'm about to uncover a political conspiracy that, had it been known at the time, could have led to a very different ending. Jenny, this is a story that's always absolutely fascinated me. What happened on that day itself? If you look 
at the, uh, at the coverage, the newspaper coverage of the early morning of November 11th, 1975, there was a sort of a lull around Canberra. There was an expectation that the political crisis which had been in existence for the previous month with supply bills blocked in the Senate had actually lifted because Whitlam had decided he would call a half Senate election. That was the political decision that would actually resolve the crisis situation. But Kerr jumped the gun and sacked his government. Whitlam, though, had an ace up his sleeve. He went to the House of Reps and moved a successful motion of no confidence in the now caretaker Prime Minister, Fraser. Malcolm Fraser should at that point have resigned. But a second thing happened which you might see as a second dismissal which is that Sir John Kerr, the Governor-General, refused to, to, to receive the Speaker of the House of Representatives and refused to accept that motion of no confidence, calling for Whitlam to be reinstated. Instead, he dissolved both Houses of Parliament and, of course, that led to an immense crowd gathering outside this very building. And that, of course, gave us one of the most memorable and imitated speeches in Australian politics. All together now, well, may we say, God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor-General. Why did John Kerr do this? I mean, he was just supposed to do a fairly simple job of representing the Queen of England, wasn't he? Well, what we now know, and this has only been recently discovered in Sir John Kerr's private papers, is that at the time, unknown to the Prime Minister, a member of the High Court of Australia, Sir Anthony Mason, was meeting with the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, regularly uh, discussing the possibility of dismissing the government for two months prior to the dismissal actually taking place. I would have thought that some of this stuff could have gone to the High Court, so that would make the High Court judge complicit in what was going on. Well, that's right, and for all those reasons, it was absolutely extraordinary that not only that they were meeting, but that they were meeting without the knowledge of the Prime Minister. I mean, the breach of protocol, the breach in the, in the separation of powers, the, 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 the really questionable moral decisions on a personal level that were made by deceiving a Prime Minister in that way is really, I think, extremely significant. And who knows, if the public had got wind of what Kerr and Mason were up to, then the impropriety of the Governor-General's behaviour may have tipped the dismissal into being politically unacceptable. No wonder they both wanted to keep it under wraps all these years. I mean, the outcry if the Queen would ever presume to remove an elected government in, in Britain can only be imagined. And yet in Australia, it was a sort of reassertion of that divine right of kings to, to remove an elected government and to replace that government with a party that had actually lost the previous two elections. So yes, I think there's no doubt now that it should never have happened, but it did happen. And so it sits there now as an unfortunate precedent that could technically occur again. Well, let's hope it never, ever does. I'm with you on that, Tony. <laughs> Thank so you. Much. Bye. Bye bye. And on that note, my time travels through the world of political intrigue and deception have come to an end. On this journey, I've witnessed how state secrets can influence everything from the destiny of governments and empires to the paths of ordinary people's lives. I've discovered the extraordinary lengths the powerful will go to to deceive the public but no matter how hard the authorities try, eventually the truth comes out. Which makes me wonder, what secrets are governments keeping from us now?